Hello and welcome to the next of the video lessons on the part 2 essay based stuff. This is focused on the essay question, how successful was the coalition government slash how successful was David Lloyd George in 1918 to 1922. The usual disclaimer applies, or we do not look at specific examples here. You must, 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 particularly for this example, make sure you have specific examples to illustrate each of these, particularly the first paragraph, which is focusing on the actions um, of the social reforms um, and that stuff. So... David Lloyd George is by far one of the most canniest and effective political operators in the 20th century. Um, deeply able to both at work within Parliament and the party, and at the same time work within a, a um, uh, pop populist bracket. However, he will be ultimately destroyed, never to come again, by 1922. Now, when asked about what the hardest thing um, about being Prime Minister was, how Macmillan, a much later Prime Minister, responded, events, dear boy, events. And I would argue that David Lloyd George is very similar. He arguably falls foul, at least on the surface, um, to reactions to particular events. And therefore, our arguments about why he fell should be based around events. Now, in reality, as we shall argue, that actually failure in these events were inevitable as opposed to um, uh, due to his own personal errors. But still, we are focusing on an event-based response. He is good in 1918, he is doomed in 1922. What events happen, what political things happen to destroy him um, and um, up until that point? And basically, when we're judging success, what events and how does he handle those, each of those events? So, um, I like to break it up into these areas. You can choose how you break up however you want. Um, you can break up, for example, spending a social policy into two different ones, combine any of those bottom three as all as one. Um, you can also bring in the honours scandal, which I suggest you do. Um, if you don't know about that, Google it or research it. The honours scandal is very, very, very helpful. Um, and you can talk about his own personal failings in that regard. Um, but these are broadly the areas we are looking at. Okay, now. The narrative will be that he is a failure, um, but in reality, we all that we can actually rehabilitate him a lot by considering the context he is in. So before we go into it, we remember that he's in a coalition. Arguably, though, in of his own making by causing a split in 1916, but he's in a coalition backed by Tories. His power and his role in government is completely dependent on the goodwill of the Tory MPs. Those Tory MPs do not naturally like him, particularly the backbenchers who do not have a personal relationship with him. The front benches get on a bit better. If he does not keep these people happy, they can get rid of him that day. If he doesn't keep other people happy at the working classes, they can get rid of him at the next election. David Lloyd George is desperately want, needing time to be in charge so that he can create a new centre-right party. Now remember that centre-right party doesn't actually happen, but he's not to know that necessarily in 1920. Um, so when we judge David Lloyd George and we try and explain why, he's, why his things are failures and why his things are successes, you need to think about his political situation. And ultimately what we'll find in all of these, advance, all these, these things are they are either successes or failures, but failures not necessarily caused by him, or policy failures, but not political failures. Because in reality, because he's in this coalition, his actions he can do, and what will help keep him in power, are pretty much dependent on his ability to keep the Tories happy. And if he's unable to keep the Tories happy, then he will quite quickly lose power. So when we judge him, and particularly for the ANA star, we need to consider the broader factors, not simply go, look at Ireland, that'd be not good, so minus one point. We need to think about it in a bit more of a greater context. So, as when we ever judge success, we break it down. We break it down by actions, aims, and con context. So, how do we judge him by his actions? We look at what he does. This is the one everyone will do at some basic level. We look at what it does and say, is it good or bad? Okay. So, but when we judge success, we can use our own personal biases and go, well, I politically disagree with that and therefore it's bad. I politically agree with that and therefore it's good. And that's not great. Uh, but if in doubt, do it. Um, essentially, we can look at these issues, Ireland, etc., and we can go, okay, does this improve or weaken the country. If it improves, you can argue it's strength, if it makes it better. If it weakens the country, it makes it worse. Uh, mostly, whenever you answer in this way, the answer will be, in this way it improves, in this way it weakens. Or it improves the country for these people, it doesn't improve these people. Or it improves in the short term, 
but not in the long term, that kind of thing. Um, that's breaking down the question. Does he achieve his democratic mandate, i.e., he was voted in to do X, did he do it? So arguably, you can already say he can, if, if for, you can argue, for example, the, his reversal of social spending in the 1920s, or in 1920, um, is something which arguably improves the country long-term economically because they're not so much spending beyond what they can, but goes against his democratic mandate, so it's a failure. So then, even by action, we show in some way by action you can judge him as a success, in some way it's a failure. Do not be afraid to confront this. You have to have an answer at the end. You can't just sort of go, oh yeah, it's just good and it's just bad. Say, so, yeah, it's good and bad, but actually this one matters more quite clearly because X. Okay, but Bill, feel free in your essay to break that down. Look at this thing. It show, does strengthen the country, but it does not. Um, it's not something he was voted in on doing. Is that good or bad? Does it achieve long-term change? You can argue something which is deeply unpopular and weakens the country in the short term might necessarily improve Britain in the long term, or if, vice versa. If we're looking at the Treaty of Versailles, we can say something which he does does reach his democratic mandate for and does in the short term get the country some more money, in the long term causes damage because it causes World War II, which causes all manner of things and people to die. So arguably isn't a good thing. So we can judge each of those things by his actions. So we've done, for example, the social spending about how you can judge it as good or bad. We've, um, Ireland, again, we can say, well, it improves the country in one reading in that there's less fighting, but it also weakens the country in that it's lost a massive chunk of its empire. And you can say, well, did it achieve its man democratic mandate? Well, it wasn't elected. He wasn't elected for that. Um, but you can say there's an implicit thing in an election that a government will keep calm. So it's a bit of a more, that's a bit more difficult to identify. But he definitely didn't campaign to end the um, uh, Irish question. But then you can argue that, that he didn't choose to get this to be an issue. The IRA, or well, the IRA, the um, Sinn Féin movement did. Um, likewise, did it achieve, achieve a long-term change to Britain? Well, you can argue... Um, uh, the um, uh, sort of Treaty of Versailles and that sort of stuff. Yes, no, maybe. Um, but when we're talking in a little bit more specific detail about Ireland, you can say, well, yes, that does uh, achieve a long-term shift in the nature of the British Isles. Is that a positive thing or a negative thing? I would contend, because it was na naturally to violence anyway, um, that's, that's positive. However, you can point out that the way he makes peace uh, with the partition of Northern Ireland, etc., leads to the troubles in the 1960s, and therefore all the problems of the IRA in the late 1960s all the way up until 1997. Um, and therefore that's a bad thing, but then you can counter that by saying, well, that's not his fault. There's peace up until 1964. It's the people who are in charge in the 1960s who are to blame for the fact that it go, then goes into violence in 1960. Um, not him in doing this in 1920. So already, if we're judging by his actions, we're already getting all sorts of yes, but no, but yes, but no, buts. We like yes, but no, buts because then we're showing off the complexity of an issue. Life is far more complicated than simply going, it is good, it is bad, because, well, that's history to some extent. And that's how we show smug intellectualism without really having that much of it. Um, so... That's Ireland. If we look at Chanak, we can. That's a little bit more easy. We can say, well, that clearly we um, th that or that clearly does not improve the international image of Britain. But because nothing happens in Chanak, it's all just words. It doesn't necessarily weaken the country either. You can argue it clearly goes against the democratic mandate because he loses popular support. But again, he never voted against peace. Yeah, um, so he voted on. It was never campaigned just for peace and campaigned as a pacifist. And, likely, and likewise, does the Titanic crisis cause long-term change? No. So we can argue, well, it's a political failure, maybe, in that it destroys his reputation, it's a poor move. Um, but in reality, it doesn't necessarily cause that issue. Okay. Um, so, moving on. So if we're judging by his actions, it's a little bit more complicated and go going, look at all these things, look how bad they are. We, are. we need to consider what makes an action inherently successful. Is it improving the country? Is it a democratic mandate? Is it long term? And what happens if they are one but not the other? Um, how do we judge them considering his aims? Now, in reality, this is slightly easier because David Lloyd George believes in nothing to some extent. Um, he is, and his aims are largely therefore political. He does not necessarily believe in particular points of ideology, and they're all flexible. His aims are to keep his political situation relatively stable. He is weak. He needs to keep 
the Tory back front bench happy because they can get rid of him. He needs to keep the Tory back benches happy because they can get rid of him. He needs to keep his coalition liberals happy because although they can't necessarily get rid of him, it looks really bad if they abandon you. Um, and he also needs to stay politically popular because that's the only reason why the Tories kept him in power. And he also, in the long term, wants to create a new centre-right party which gives him more, a more secure base. So if we go back to the different factors and we go to, for example, if we work our way chronologically, the, the spending and social policy stuff, you can argue, in the 19, up until 1920s, he's successful at all of those, apart from keeping the backbenchers happy. Because actually, they did not like this massive social spending, but they were prepared to go along with it because it was popular. When he reverses all that spending in 1920, arguably, that helps keep the first two happy, okay, but not the last two. Yep, so the Tory front benches are now still happy because they like David Lloyd George, but they're also Tory. Tory backbenchers are now happy that there's massive government cuts, but the coalition liberals, who are naturally new liberal in their disposition, NL, um, now are annoyed, Anderson being the classic example of someone who has sacrificed the walls in order to keep the Tory backbenchers happy. They are annoyed and they support him less. And more than that, the reversal of government policy massively, massively undermines um, his popularity, the popularity of the masses. And that's a problem because you can argue in the long term that's a political failure. Because if David Lloyd George's power is completely dependent on the um, Tory backbenchers, any, um, be, and the Tory backbenchers are only supporting him because he's popular the masses, for him to lose power, popularity in the masses is not great. Um, so you could argue politically the social spending stuff is good for different aims at different points, but arguably doesn't necessarily help him. But as you can see, if it's good for one point and one group and bad for the other, etc., is it possible for him to keep everyone happy? Is it possible for him to be politically popular the masses and also keep the backbenchers happy? And I would suggest that this social spending stuff suggests it's not. He can either do one or the other. So yes, he is a failure but in that regard, and that he doesn't necessarily, the spending stuff doesn't keep his political aims going. But could it possibly have ever done that? Um, if we move on, we can talk about the other post-war economic foreign policy. That's mostly the Treaty of Versailles. We can argue, yes, it keeps the front bench happy. The back bench grumble that it's too harsh, but they are both probably supportive. The new liberals are happy. It's very popular, but it doesn't necessarily lead to the sense right parties. But again, broadly, that's a political success. So tick, tick for that. If we talk about Ireland, again, that's another problem. Because front benches are uneasy, but they go along with it. The back benches feel absolutely betrayed and this is arguably what really triggers them to lose support for him the new the coalition liberal liberals are happy with home rule to some extent but they do not like the fact it's been such a compromise and necessarily don't necessarily care about this as much as they care about the betrayal and social policy and again the masses don't see it as a bad thing that now there's peace in ireland but they don't necessarily see it as a hero good thing either okay but if we judge the irish question by its actions for example it's an incredibly impressive thing to make both these two seemingly irreconcilable groups, the Tory backbenchers and the Sinn Féin movement, agree to a compromise. That's a deeply impressive political action. So if we judge it by his action, it's a success to some extent. If we judge it by his aims, it's a failure because it actually annoys the people, in, um, annoys the people who really, he really depends on, the backbenchers, and will lead to his fall. So again, we're breaking it up by question, by um, different types of ways of looking at it. So Ireland, by its aims, does not keep him in power, therefore is a failure. Um, if we judge Chanak, now again, Chanak is your standard, like, it is bad, because what that does is annoys everyone. Now, what is interesting about Chanak, and we'll mention again, is Chanak was, an, uh, was initially an attempt of David Lloyd George to get the Conservatives to support him. Things you can rely on the Conservatives normally to do is to support any military intervention against a foreigner um, who is attacking a slightly less foreign foreigner. Okay, I when the Greeks attack are attacked, sorry, by the Turks and genocided to some extent um, uh, by the Turks, David Lloyd George can reasonably expect the Tories to actually support him. <coughs> and there is an argument that actually the reason he started the Chanak crisis is so he can wave his sort of patriotic flag, wave a machine gun in the all, in the direction of the Turk, and get some backbench support for low cost. The backbenchers absolutely take him down, though, unexpectedly. And you can argue that's not because they've suddenly grown pacifistic. 
but because they want to, an issue to destroy David Lloyd George on. They don't want to, like, to see it as a good thing because it's his policy, and they want to use it instead as a stick to beat him with. <clears throat> so we can argue Chanak, yes, is a political failure, but it's only a political failure because the right wing massively decided they suddenly don't want to support the Chanak crisis. And that's as much political reasoning as it is about their natural de predisposition. So, for those who didn't quite get that first time around, the idea is actually Chanuk, the Tories should have supported it, but they didn't because they wanted, to, they hated David Lloyd George and they wanted to do damage to him instead. And therefore, is Chanuk a failure because it hurts his reputation, or is it a failure because it gives his enemies who already hate him an opportunity to hurt his reputation, and therefore it's less of a direct problem in and of itself? Because obviously, something which makes your enemies hate you is probably a, a worse mistake than something which the enemies are using against you, but they always hate you along. And the last thing is by judging by context, and this is really uh, sort of important for the island question, for example, and also to a lesser extent the social justice stuff. Okay, in reality, what events are forced upon him because of the economic downturn? What events are thrust upon him and he doesn't have a choice over? And what events are of his own making? If an event, if a crisis happens because of his own making, um, uh, and um, that suggests that actually he's hurt himself and therefore that's a massive failure. So if we think about the social policy stuff, he does do good social policy and he does ignore the grumpiness of the conservatives up until 1920. And so you can argue that actually his intentions were there. The economic downturn means that he, the Tories um, now have a moral reason to stop all these um, cuts and therefore pressure him to stop, sorry, stop all these spending. Then they have a moral reason to cause cuts. And therefore, he has, suddenly has all this political pressure where he didn't have it before to make cuts, spending cuts. So rather, he is having to make these reverse his policy on social spending, not because he wants to, but because the economic downturn has forced him to politically. Likewise, you consider the context of the time in terms of Treaty of Versailles. This is a really hard treaty. You've got Wilson and Clemenceau in F USA and France all wanting completely different deals to Britain. Wilson wants a really generous deal. Clemenceau wants a really harsh deal. I'm sure you're getting echoes to year nine right now. Um, and therefore, for David Lloyd George to come out of this high power, high politics negotiation with pretty much the best deal Britain could get, punishing harshly enough but not too much so they lose Germany as a trading partner, that shows a lot of skill. So actually, considering the context, they, him getting that deal, which is punishing enough to keep the people happy, but not too punishing so as to reduce the amount of exports Britain can make to Germany too much, is great. Likewise of Ireland, it is deeply impressive that he manages to make a deal between Sinn Féin and the Tories and Ulsterman. That's impossible. He gets the Tories to vote for it to some degree. They don't all vote for it, obviously. But that's deeply impressive. Um, and in reality... That should be deeply respected. It doesn't matter if it politically harms him, it's a, um, at, or it doesn't, doesn't necessarily lead to long-term peace. Um, but it is not necessarily, you know, it's still a good thing. Um, Chanak. Chanak, Chanak, Chanak. This, however, is his miscalculation. This is a problem of his own making. He is trying to be too smart here. He doesn't recognise that the Tories won't necessarily go, oh, yeah, yeah, I love David Lloyd George now. He sort of thinks of them as a bit too simplistic. He knows they don't like him, that's why he does Chanak, in order to get them to like him. But he doesn't suspect, and I would say it's a reasonable suspicion for someone as intelligent as David Lloyd George, that perhaps they might not fall for the bait hook, line and sinker. And instead they will U-turn it around and attack him with it, which is what they do. So I argue that damages him and that's completely his own fault. Although you can argue defending people from genocide isn't necessarily a bad thing. So... That is a really, really brief overview about the ideas. Um, you've probably paused it at points and write stuff down. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're going to spend the most of the time on this very complex diagram, but it will become more obvious as time goes on. Essentially, the, the, this question is very easy to answer to get a B, but difficult to get the A and A star. It is very easy to list those four factors and say, social policy was bad because he did bad things and it made people sad. Post-war foreign policy was good because the Treaty of Versailles was good, and but some people were grumpy about the stuff after the war. Ireland was good because it was um, a peace, but it was bad because it made everyone sad and led to the IRA. Chanak crisis was bad. So that's the general response. Success in a prime ministerial context is deeply flawed as a measure. And the reason they like asking questions about success is because that gives you stuff to play with. Essentially, 
when we look at each of these, your answer, we'll probably not have time to mention them all, but needs to focus on, well, successful for whom? And um, how does it affect, how can it be judged through his actions, his aims, and the context? So if we look at social policy, social policy pre-1920 um, is deeply popular amongst the um, poor masses, to some extent in middle classes, but much less so. Liberals, to some extent, definitely not the social Tory backbench, and definitely not the front bench. So you can argue the radical reforms in 1920 are good by his actions, because it you know, needs some change and it fulfills his democratic mandate. But if his aim is to keep politically viable, that's not great because the people he needs to stay in power are the backbenchers. But also it helps his aims because he needs to stay in power because, and that together, he needs to support all the masses. So simultaneously, it helps state keep him in power, but at the same time helps hurt him keep him in power, i.e. is it ever possible that he that keeps both sides happy uh, on social policy? And considering the context um, of the time, and the optimism of time, we can say, well, he did a, do a lot of reform very quickly, and that's good. Post-1920 reform, we can take the exact same arguments and combining things out. That is more popular amongst the Tory front benches, the Tory back benches, the middle classes, less popular amongst the liberals, and deeply unpopular and a betrayal by the poor masses. Now, you can say this hurts his action, this is actions-wise, um, is bad because he's going back on his men of de democratic mandate, but is good because considering the downturn, he's keeping the economy afloat. That's a context thing as well. Um, you can say by his aims, it is good because it helps keep the Tory backbenchers happy, which helps keep him stay in power, but it's bad because it makes him unpopular amongst the masses, which means that he is less useful to the backbenchers and they're more likely to get rid of him. So again, is it possible that he has the best he can win here? Um, likewise, you can say in the long term this is bad because this really takes the sheen, the image, the glisten of David Lloyd George. He has betrayed a little too many people on this issue and therefore this has upset many, many groups in society. Um, Considering the context, you can say, well, he had no control over the economic downturn. And the idea of, is it possible for him to be politically popular um, amongst both groups? And you can argue no. So social policy, if the summary is, the summary should not necessarily be that he fails. It should be, ultimately, it is um, a political failure for two completely different reasons at two completely different times. But one which is arguably inevitable given the coalition. Yeah, he can't in the co his job is the coalition to keep two groups happy, but he can't possibly keep two groups happy. And considering the context, we can actually give him a little leeway. Considering how hard his situation is with the um, economic downturn, how hard it is with the pressure on the backbenches, we can forgive him perhaps for going back on his promises in 1920. Post-war foreign policy is probably the glistening light here. Um, this is primarily Treaty of Versailles, but also the League of Nations and some other stuff. Um, but primarily it's that sort of stuff. Arguably, most groups broadly support it with varying degrees of interest. Middle classes, backbent, and Tories tend to be a little bit more focused on foreign policy stuff elsewhere. But you can argue that if his democratic mandate was to punish Germany until, quote unquote, the pip squeak, then um, he does do that. The pun people do believe the punishment is enough. You can argue this helps in the short term because it gives them an infusion of cash. Um, but in the long term, you can argue it harms them because it, he punishes them more than he perhaps wants. He, rather than punish them, be a bit more generous to them, and therefore they would have a better economy, therefore Britain can export more stuff. He realises, or he believes, that people will be really angry if, if, it's, if, the, law, if the treaty scene is too kind. So therefore he errs on the side of making it too harsh, which helps keep him popular in the short term, but hurts the economy in the long term. If we're going to judge him by his aims, you can say the post-war foreign policy is deeply successful. It makes him popular amongst all people, and um, is therefore very, very successful. And by context, again, we can say it's very, very successful. In reality, um, as mentioned before, it is very hard to negotiate with two other leaders of major nations, one of whom is much more powerful than you, i.e. the USA, um, and get far more than what you wanted, i.e. sort of middle ground, um, than what the other two wanted. Now, you can counter that by saying David Lloyd George wanted the a, a level of punishment um, um, in between Clemenceau and Wilson. So naturally, because negotiations always find a middle ground, he will naturally, almost by accident, find his way getting more of what he wants than everyone else. But still, you can say he plays it well. So that's first for post for foreign policy. The broad answer here is largely it is successful, although perhaps the actual details of the deal long term aren't great for Britain.
Um, politically, it's great. Ireland. Now, Ireland, Ireland, Ireland. So, Irish problems. You shouldn't, you're going to research that in your own time. I'm not, um, we're not going to go over it. But essentially, it descends into civil war, repression, and that has no way out in reality. You, there are very few examples which don't, requ- which don't include concentration camps and genocide of an insurgency which is beaten in this period. Okay? Um, so, in reality, it needs peace. And you can say, therefore, considering that this is a, you know, there's no way this ends without peace, there's no way this went otherwise, um, that's quite a good thing. You, you can say, well, it wasn't his democratic mandate to get it fixed, if judging him by his actions. Um, but um, still, you can say, well, actually, it, doesn't, it, it was a crisis which confronts him, and it, the people don't necessarily vote, vote him expecting every single crisis to come up. Um, you can say long term it's good, I, it stops there being a civil war and therefore keeps six years of um, peace, or well, 14 years of peace. Or you can say long term it's bad because it um, causes a partition of Northern Ireland that will in turn lead to all the crises, etc. of the late 20th century. But you can balance that by saying actually no, that's not his fault because that was, that's the politicians then who create that crisis, not him. Um, and he has 40 years of peace afterwards, so that's not necessarily evidence to show that he is bad. The, when we move on to AIDS, when we move on to it, it's important to see how this was viewed. We've already mentioned this once, but we'll go over it again. Um, toy front benches are are naturally pro Ulsterman, but their relationship, David Lloyd George, is just enough to get them to believe in it. Back benches absolutely hate it and are forced to vote for it to some extent through whipping, although many rebel. The Liberals are broadly supportive but are uncomfortable with the fact it still keeps the northern partition going it's not really home rule and are also not na- massively caring about home rule it's a good issue to unify them but it doesn't matter as much as the fact that David Lloyd George has betrayed them on social policy middle classes again broadly more patriotic tend to see this as a failure it doesn't bother them as much working classes yeah it's not a bad thing but it's not a great thing they care about either so in terms of his aims, Ireland, perhaps in terms of what it gets actions-wise, is you know maybe quite good. His political aims is a disaster. It really undermines his support amongst groups that keep his him in power, i.e. the Tory backbenchers, but at the same time do not necessarily make other groups like him to balance that. Um, you can argue that the fact that there wasn't more violence helps him long term politically because a, go- a government which is constant fighting a terrorist war will or insurgency apologies. Um, will be um, uh, naturally more and more unpopular as they fail to do the war, but that's cr- grasping at straws, I would say. But we can rescue him a little bit when we look at the context. Um, you can say, actually, you know, considering his aim is peace, and this is a seemingly contradictory thing where the Tories are going, i.e. people in his government, we will not give peace on any, you know, Ireland will always be part of Britain, and Sinn Féin are going... Ireland will always be, will never be part of Britain. To find a middle ground and get both group sides to agree to it, admittedly through the exhaustion of a long-term insurgency campaign, um, is deeply impressive. And then to get both sides to agree to it is very impressive. Now you can point out that actually, although they agree to it, there's a huge civil war in Ireland straight afterwards as a result of this deal. But that's not massively David George's problem or issue really. Um, although it's probably his fault to some extent. Um, so therefore, judging the context, we can say, yeah, it's politically a disaster, long term, uh, we're not sure, but it's not a bad thing. But like the context, you say, it is deeply impressive he got that done. So actually, we're being a bit kind to Timor Island, similar to social policy. Now, Chanak. Chanak is not necessarily part of its own paragraph. I keep it separate because it's the thing which destroys David Lloyd George in his most unpopular thing. And um, we'll talk about the honor scandal briefly. Um, but um, if we judge Chanak by the actions, does it make the country stronger or weaker? Well, it actually doesn't make a difference either way. Does it land his democratic mandate? Well, it's not really on his democratic mandate, really. Um, does it um, uh, help in the country in the long term? It doesn't make a difference because nothing happens. So actually, as a thing, Chanak isn't great. It doesn't matter because Chanak is just David Lloyd George saying something. People are getting angry at David Lloyd George saying something and nothing happening. Yeah, no one really gets shot. As a result, now, according to his aims to stay politically popular, Chanak is an absolute disaster. Everyone is annoyed at him. But we can balance that by saying, well, to be honest, um, Tories should have massively supported that. 
The only reason they don't, and to some extent the masses don't, because they read the Tory supporting press, is because they've sensed weakness. And they think that this is an issue which they can destroy um, David Lloyd George on. And therefore they've got, rather than go for their default patriotism, glory, glory, hallelujah, defend the Greeks from the Turks, they have gone a much more pacifistic, we don't want war line, which is curious, considering they are also at the same time advocating war with the Soviet Union. Um, so that's one thing. Now you can say, therefore, that's not hit so much David Lloyd George to blame. That's because he, you know, longer term political changes in the backbenchers increasingly disliking him as a result of Ireland lead them to decide to ambush him here. The balance on that balance, though, is, well... He should have seen this coming, really. He was being too clever by half. He was trying to manipulate the Tories and sort of assume they'd fall into this hook line thinker, and of course they don't, as already mentioned. And considering the context, you can say this is not forced, this is an unforced error, but to some extent this happens because of the nature of his coalition rather than his poor government. Had he had his own government, he would not need to do Chanak and it wouldn't have happened. But he felt the need to try and keep the Tories in line, therefore he did Chanak, therefore it all went wrong. So had there not been a coalition, had the context been different, it wouldn't have happened. So is this David Lloyd George's failure or is this a failure plus the coalition? So there are broad ways of breaking it down. I've gone through a lot of basic ways. This is about getting you to think about how to break down the question as opposed to giving you all the answers. You will need to find specific evidence for all of this. Some other ones you could bring in if you want to combine post-war foreign policy, Ireland, and the Chanak crisis, although I personally think that's a bit too much. Combining one big paragraph, it's better to split it up. Um, so maybe foreign policy successes and failures, i.e. Ireland, Chanak, and failures. Um, is the honest scandal. You can also break up the social policy and spending, or even if you want to show off social policy and industrial policy with his reaction to the miners, you must research the reaction to the miners um, and the stuff around nationalisation and denationalisation, etc. Um, honor scandal, um, if you're going to drive by actions, it is not great that one sells honours, but does it harm democracy that much? Um, aims politically, uh, actually, well, it does help get him more money. Um, and many of the people who um, he'd get honours will be the people who support his new centre-right party. So arguably it's not bad, but ultimately the fact that he got caught meant that politically he lost a lot of support from many people, he looked dodgy, and the context, actually what he was doing is fairly normal at this point in time, um, and therefore the fact that the Tories were so, oh, oh, so bad, so bad, they've been doing it for generations. They, this is more about them wanting to stab David Lloyd George in the back, as opposed to necessarily the moral wrongness of what he's doing. David Lloyd George's mistake was not doing it, it was getting caught. Uh, and he got caught because he got greedy, because he did too many. Okay? Um, so arguably, considering the time, it's not so bad, because actually it's quite common in this period. Okay, so, considering all of this, and considering this situation, is it possible for him to be truly successful? And I think this question, when you're looking at this, really has to link to the um, nature of the coalition. I would contend that it is possible to navigate social policy, foreign policy, Ireland, and therefore, and also not have Chanak, if David Lloyd George was in charge of only a Liberal Party majority. He would have to make fewer compromises and worries about the right wing of his party. He is t attempting, essentially, to keep the left-wing happy, left-wing working-class masses happy and populist at the same time as keeping the right-wing conservatives happy. And he cannot rely on the Tory backbenchers to just do what the Tory frontbenchers tell them to do, as, as mentioned last lesson why. Well, lesson before last why. So actually, you can argue that in reality, he is always, if his aim, I think his aim is to stay politically powerful and popular, are always going to be limited. And even that, even his decisions will be affected. He does not have room for manoeuvre to make decisions which are actually good. He always has to keep one eye on keeping the backbenchers happy and the masses happy. So therefore it forces him to make decisions he doesn't necessarily want to make. So you can argue that because of the coalition, he finds himself boxed in. Now, if you want to show off, you can say, well, that's his own fault because he got in the coalition because of his own arrogance and causing a split and still wanting to be in charge. But that's a question for the next video lesson which is how far does David Lloyd George um, deserve to fall, uh, to fall and what was his main reason for falling. But when we think about therefore David Lloyd George, he's a tre essentially trying to be a 19th century politician, a personality politician, someone who is above party, above ideology, someone who people vote for based on personality. He is trying to create a consensus 
as a support base across the entire political spectrum from mass working classes who give him his popular support through the middle classes through the liberals through the conservatives and i would contend that in so doing because he has to in order to stay in power in the coalition he essentially angers everyone it is impossible to make decisions which keep everyone happy politically and or it requires you to make dodgy decisions which you wouldn't normally do in order to stay in power and what destroys David Lloyd George and where his biggest failures are are him losing political support or making dodgy decisions in order to stay in power so if we're being nice to David Lloyd George we can say he doesn't suddenly become incompetent he doesn't go from this deeply effective minister from 1905 well 1906 but 1905 he's involved perfectly up until World War I and then suddenly become rubbish he f his room for manoeuvre and he is the arch manoeuvrer is significantly lessened by the fact he's now in a coalition where he has to both simultaneously keep backbench Tories happy and also make sure that the masses support him and therefore he makes silly decisions therefore politically he's always going to anger someone and therefore eventually he's going to lose power so I would contend therefore had David Lloyd George had to make not any decisions I make respond to any events then it would have been fine had he argue focus just on foreign policy then he would have been maybe better because foreign policy is always less um, controversial but he couldn't do that because he's promised all sorts of reforms in order to get elected so overall David Lloyd George I would condemn as an impossible position to stay in power and many of his decisions he makes are not because he suddenly becomes incompetent but because he's forced to by the nature of the coalition okay that was a real wistful stop you really need to this is um need to think about the ideas about how we bent the questions and in your notes see how you can make them apply for different areas in your essays you will not cover all these counterpoints and counterpoints and counterpoints if you just mention one or two per paragraph that is absolutely fine you are certainly not going to mention aims context and actions all at the same time you might do actions and context actions and aims etc that is just the spice to show off you still need a core of a good essay a well-reasoned argument one that has an argument and a judgment in the end one that has evidence to prove it but this is the stuff which is essential in essays you do to show off and get the extra marks okay next we're going to be looking at the fall of David Lloyd George we probably won't be doing that for a while because I'm now officially losing my voice um, so apart from that enjoy and um, I'll see you in the next video lesson